of all, I just love skiing, like so much. There's nothing in the world that brings me more joy ever. Scared to death right now, but I've got this. Like I know deep down inside, I'm capable of what I'm about to do. I felt like the rehab was pretty simple and straightforward and I learned how to appreciate my body and how to take care of it, what to eat and like to stretch. I was 18 so I felt like I was invincible at the time. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, welcome to the Athletic Stance Podcast, a skier's perspective with your host, yours truly, Scott Chrisman. In this podcast, I have made it my job to go out and interview skiers at the highest level of the sport, to explore their perspective on life, what shaped and influenced them to become the person they are, and a whole lot more. First, let's take a look at our sponsors, because without them, none of this is possible. Our first sponsor is Northwest Tech. If you haven't heard of them yet, you're missing out. They hand bank customizable three layer outerwear to order in the Pacific Northwest. And that means you know that it keeps you warm, dry, and looking unique while you're sending it around the mountain. They've been generous enough to give me a coupon code for my listeners. Use the code AOS75 to get $75 off any custom piece of outerwear. Their site is in the show notes. This episode is brought to you by POC. POC makes the best helmets, goggles, and protective wear out there. They've been dedicated to protecting athletes since day one, and I wouldn't wear a different helmet, goggle, back pad, or hip pads. With their spin technology and VPD system, there are no other products on the market that are like it. Definitely go and check out pocksports.com and protect yourself today. What is up, guys? Welcome back to The Athletic Stance, episode number 23. I cannot believe how fast these weeks keep ticking along. This week's episode is a good friend of mine, a member of the Freeride World Tour for the last five years, who's moving on and doing his own webisode series. And I really enjoyed this conversation. He's one of the most genuine souls I've ever met in skiing. And he really just loves skiing for what it is. I really appreciated getting his perspective on the podcast. Without further ado, Mr. Connor Pelton. What's up, guys? I'm Connor Pelton. Uh, just living here in Telluride, Colorado, but skiing out of Jackson Hall. And uh, I've been a Fred World Tour athlete for the last five years and just enjoying life and traveling the world with my skis. Hell yeah, Connor. Welcome to the show. I really appreciate you taking the time to be here. Thank you. It's been a while since we've connected, so it's good to have uh, <laughs> this time to reconnect with you. For uh, sure. We competed when it was uh, the Free Ride World Tour had kind of just merged, and you, I think it was pretty much that first year, you did really well at a lot of the competitions and made it on. And uh, it's been incredible to see the journey, like five years in a row being on the tour. That's that's been awesome. Um, what's been your favorite part? about the last five years being a part of the free skiing or the free ride world tour probably favorite part uh last five years on the tour would be uh getting to travel to places that uh never really dreamed of going uh and doing it with great people i met along the way uh from all over the world and just creating a bond with those people and getting to ski just insane locations and great 
pow and also bad conditions too you know it wasn't always great as snow so it was a good adventure yeah totally that's when the people come in and make it a lot better right yeah yeah no it's awesome and like skiing's not good you know you always got your crew and your friends and people you're meeting along the way and showing you little secret stashes and making it all an adventure yeah yeah totally what's your the like if you have it uh do you have a a number one or a favorite spot that you've been in the last five years that the free ride world tour has taken you wow uh tough one every spot is just rad on its own account you know um, yeah but probably culture uh the people the accessibility to such insane skiing and uh would have to be right up there andorra um andorra is just awesome it's crazy what you can just access from the chairlifts and just with quick traverses or ridge lines and there's not many people trying to get it so it's pretty awesome hell yeah yeah, I assume, you know, part of what goes into play with that is the conditions and how the conditions line up at each place. Yeah. Like, yeah. you know, you have that those killer powder days at, at one specific place and you're like, oh, yep, that place, <laughs> that yeah. one. <laughs> yeah, no, seriously. And that's even like how Japan was this year. It was kind of just like went in early uh, with my buddy George Rodney and we posted up for like 10 days before the event was possibly even going to start and hit it perfect, skied crazy pow. And it was just what you dreamt Japan was going to be like. And then it turned to rain for four days and you're like, what? This isn't supposed to happen. We're in Japan. What's going on right now? And then yeah. just a week later was great again. And so that place just will always have a lasting memory. I still have yet to make it to Japan. Well, there's always next year. Right? It's like Warren Miller said, if you don't do it this year, you're one year older when you do. I was just <laughs> thinking that same thing. I'm like, shoot, just uh, I'm just getting older over here. What the <laughs> yeah. heck? Yeah, that's oh. all right. Powder feels even better. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Totally, especially after injuries. Yeah, seriously. Oh, speaking of injuries, you had a ACL injury while you were on the tour. How's your, was it ACL? ACL. Yeah, ACL, MCL, uh, medial lateral meniscus and tibia plateau fracture. That was uh, in Alaska, right? Yeah, it was still probably one of the most fun runs of my life until that moment. So, it's all right. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, but yeah, knee feels great. Uh Last year, I felt like was the best it had felt since the injury. So it was really good to have that full confidence back and just feeling great with or without falls all the time. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, what did that rehab look like for you? How long until you were back at it, kind of full swing um, and everything? Uh, so rehab was – kind of slower than I had planned honestly yeah it was definitely a mental battle because I kind of was just expecting to go into it and get after it and feel great and not be stressed about it and just you know like looking at people's protocols and how long it took them to do things I was like oh yeah all right yeah that's where I'll be at no worries like this is gonna be cool and then you know all of a sudden you're not even that far into it and you're like whoa feel really behind and then you find out you are behind and it's crazy i felt like it took i thought it was going to take me six months to be fully firing and 100 percent, and then it felt like it was over a year before i was really even there and so that was kind of hard to grasp at first but those little progressions you had made it that much better when you had them they like really got you motivated and fired up got you out of the slumps when you were down and kind of felt like it was going slow and then you'd see these little progressions and then it would be a little bit more and you're like okay we're getting somewhere it's happening and then skiing whether it was skiing hard or not just skiing was really the ultimate thing to be able to do yeah like that's really what would just cure the mindset side of it where you're down in the dumps and it just pull you right back out 
Yeah. You know, yep. Like, that you was know. definitely one of the big ones for me was being able to get back on the slopes. That's for sure. I'm going to say, you know, like even if you're not feeling hundred percent, but you're on your skis, it's just like, okay, I'm back on my skis. This is a good start right here. Yeah, definitely. I, I felt like for me, it took forever to get the last couple percent back. Yeah. And that started to get really irritating for me on the slopes because I'd have like these little pains. I don't know if it was scar tissue or just, you know, like that last little 3% that needed to heal or whatever it was. But I like, it was March before I hurt my tibia this year. And uh, I was still having pains in my right knee. And I'm like, it's been almost a year since surgery. Like, yeah. But at the same time, nothing beats skiing. Having the wind in your face, even if you, even if you are dealing with a little bit of pain, you're like, yup. <laughs> yeah. And when you're doing it, it's like you don't really feel it until you're like at the bottom again. Necessarily, you're like also like, oh, oh, all right, yeah, that's a little tender still. But yeah. in the moment, you're just like, oh hell yeah, let's go. <laughs> right. Let's go send. Yeah, but I get that. That last bit is what takes forever, and that aftershock pain too like where you're just sore for like a full day after it's all yeah. worth it yeah definitely did you uh do any sort of like what was the protocol when you were healing was there like uh any sort of diet routine that you're following fitness routine or obviously probably pt but yeah i was i was doing pt um <clears throat> but i was also really lucky at the time i was skiing uh and working out with Crystal Wright and with her gym uh, up in Jackson Hall and it's Wright training. And you know that uh, that's what I really uh, can thank and believe that the a lot of the reason why I came back and came back uh, to be able to like compete on the tour and feel comfortable on the tour again was uh, her protocol that she put me on, uh, her and her husband. And it was just it was awesome. Like, uh, I was still in the, like a leg immobilizer, but fully working on my core and my shoulders, keeping my mental game in it by like at least being physical and working out things. And then uh, just uh, as my PT progressed, my workouts with her progressed. And uh, I think that was one of the most beneficial parts of uh, the mental side of injuries was she kept me on a protocol and kept me active knowing I was still working towards something to come back. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. When you have that ultimate vision and goal and like, you know that you're, even if you know you're at step two, like you made it out of surgery and yeah. like, you know, whatever. I, I definitely, I hit up my personal trainer even before I had surgery as well. And I was like, we're working out my core. We're working out. Yeah. We're <laughs> no, and it's out. huge. And it's huge, and I think keeping that workout routine going even, you know, through the surgery and everything, it helps you process toxins. It helps you process, like, just emotionally, like, having a workout, like, a venue to help process things. Like, for me, I need workouts to keep mental sanity. Yeah, for sure. Having that there, I think it really helps. No, it does, and, like, it is, like, uh, especially, yeah, like, sweating everything out, you know, like getting all that bad out and just taking in the good and uh no but like f like food wise that's something i've always struggled with i just love food you know <laughs> doesn't matter uh i uh i'm eating a lot healthier now my girlfriend's got me on the right track for a healthy diet all the time which i know is beneficial for the body and everything but i'm a midwestern boy i like my food you know I yeah like that. those hearty meals oh yeah, <laughs> yeah. so uh yeah, during the regimen of that, um, yeah, just stayed away from uh, trying to drink too much or anything like that. And, uh, you know, smoking, which I'm not really a smoker, so that's all good. But I just never really was trying to drink much because anytime you even had a couple beers, it's just you felt the injury like crazy. So yeah. I was just like, no, obviously this isn't good because I only had two beers last night and my knee's sore. So probably shouldn't have any right now. Yep. Yeah, totally. Yeah, not drinking for me has definitely helped me recover for sure. But yeah. sometimes it's hard not like you get in those situations where life has already like smacked you down a little bit. You're like, yeah. well, shit, I might as well eat, you know, eat what I want or drink yeah. whatever. <laughs> and it's like that's the time when you almost need to do the opposite and be healthier. But 
you know, yeah. status quo. Everyone's like, oh, you're injured. Yeah, let's yeah. party. Like, you're <laughs> never home or, you know, like, you, yeah. know, you never have time. Like, whatever. Like, oh, gosh. No, it's true. Like, uh, and what are you doing? If you're not injured, you're never going out except for, like, after an insane day. Yep. Because you want to wake up first thing in the morning for the next day and be out there early, like, if it's snowing, you know? If you're drinking, it's about the opera because you're going to bed early. That's why yeah, the Austrians totally. do it so well. <laughs> yeah, totally. And they're diehard about skiing. They're like, oh, yeah, we'll invent opera skiing. So then we just drink early and go to bed early. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, man. Yeah. Diet's definitely an interesting one for sure. What, um,. What about like mindset through the the injury phase? Was there were you seeing like a sports psych? Was Crystal Wright helping at all with the you know any sort of of I don't know if she does anything on that front, but well, you know, like uh, always there to vent to, and um, if you have close people around you to vent to, and um, kind of just looked at uh, game plans and goals that I wanted for myself and uh, what you know, like you feel comfortable talking to people about and what you're excited about and their feedback. And, um, of course, Crystal was always there for that. I got great family friends, you know, who are always there for that. So that's a huge help. Uh, feel comfortable around your close friends and family to be able to talk to them about stuff like that. And, you know, like, dude, I want to do this. Or like, Hey, what do you think about this? And, uh, it's good to like, be able to have those people to talk to or they're like you're freaking crazy man that's not gonna happen like get your mind right and you're like okay all right yeah you're right probably shouldn't think about that like just focus on the step ahead right now just competing again not trying to do anything else and then getting back to that point and then being okay now these are my goals i want to do after competing i want to succeed in this side of it next so it's just the stepping stones definitely i think creating a support network is massive in any like just for anyone in in all you know in anyone's life it's important to have a support network because you never know when life's gonna do something to you and it's always good to have those places where you can vent or you know like reflect like hey i've got this idea like dude you're crazy (laughs) yeah no and yeah it's good to have that it's good to have the people you know who know you well enough that they know when you're on the right track or you're not and they'll put you in check or give you that stoke my cat is going nuts at the door I can hear my voice outside and wants to come in <laughs> that's so funny I can't. Yeah. <laughs> i'm about to let him in here <laughs> yeah <laughs> for sure you need to let him in well he's just at the door and can hear my voice in here talking to you and he's freaking out he wants to come in that's so funny let him in. well no he'll cry too much and be annoying for this that wouldn't be good for the viewers um so how did you originally get into skiing originally got into skiing uh well my parents uh loved skiing and uh i was lucky enough to have a couple uh aunts who moved out to colorado after college because i'm from michigan and uh they were the ones who kind of took the first step and jumped out to Colorado and wanted to be ski bums and work at ski areas. And I had one uh, in Eldora and then the other one in Aspen. And so when I was two, uh, I took my first road trip out West with my parents. And of course I don't remember, but uh, they took the family out and we visited both my aunts, one in Eldora and Aspen and became a yearly ritual after that. And getting lucky enough to come out west as a kid and see the mountains and ski bums living out of their shacks like once my aunt moved to telluride i would just walk by these ski bums every day and they lived in little caravans and rvs in this parking lot back before telluride was super blown up and they would just be out there with their skis i was like i want to do that someday and then as I got older in Michigan, if you wanted to be pursue skiing, kind of you just chase gates and was a ski racer. And that uh, progressed into uh, doing a lot of races all over the country and North America. And uh, yeah, and that's where like 
I don't know, I guess from a young age, I was just fully in love with it and just changed what I, every phase of my life, I changed what I loved in skiing the most, whether it was racing and then like skiing park and then free ride and then big mountain. And now it's kind of accumulated into where I just love every aspect of it and stoked on the experience that I've gotten to have through all those phases of skiing. Yeah, totally. How did you like first get introduced to ski racing besides you just followed the correlation of the only way that I was going to ski or I'm going to ski out here is if I'm a ski racer? Well, yeah, it was kind of, uh, it was actually my older sister. Uh, she's five years older than me and my parents both worked full time. So my sister was on the ski club and I was in kindergarten or first grade and they asked uh, if I could join the ski club so I could ride the bus up with my sister and be skiing. And uh, they agreed to it. And part of the ski club was you were in ski racing clubs. And so that's what ski club was and in where I was from in Michigan. And so it was just like go up to our 300 foot ski area and we would just hot lap it all night with our instructors and our coaches and I just got to tag along because I was super little and I just stuck stayed with it. it was, my sister was always older than me and she raced all through high school and everything and I just kind of followed her path and loved every minute of it and the friends that I had like in ski club as a kid and you know I guess and then it was like oh you can race USSA and you can travel across the country instead of just the state and race and so I tried that and love that and kind of just kept going with wherever I could go skiing totally and then how'd you get introduced to the big mountain scene or I guess park you said park after that so how'd you get introduced to park and then the big mountain scene after that I was in CMC Colorado Mountain College in Steamboat and uh was on their ski team and I was just finding myself uh, skipping practice all the time to go ski park and any pow day just saying I had too much homework to do and would just go ski. And so (laughs) I kind of realized at that point, I didn't really care much about ski racing anymore. So I probably should stop. And that's when I stopped and all my buddies in the dorms were park rats. And so I was like, yeah, I'll go ski park, you know, like, As a kid growing up ski racing, you were, you know, like how many kids were always on their race skis in the park, like trashing the race skis. Exactly. And so you were watching all these (laughs) movies and you're like, oh man, that's, that's so cool. That's so cool. And you're a ski racer. So you're like just trying to go in the park whenever your coaches weren't catching you or your parents were getting pissed at you because you were (laughs) grinding on your trainer skis and stuff. And. And it was just kind of like, oh, all right, I should just get some twin tips and go shred the park with my friends. And then it was just <laughs> like, wow, this is insane. And <laughs> it was. It was so fun. And after that year in Steamboat, I was just like, all right, I'm going to move to Breck and just ski the best park because everybody says that's the best park. And so I had a couple of buddies from college, and we are like, there's a CMC there. And so we were like, screw it, let's go there. And uh, we moved down to Frisco and just rode Breck and Keystone every day. And it was awesome. But then it progressed to I had a roommate and her name was Amanda Tessweed and she would go with Whit Bosher to all the different big mountain comps and I was a park rat and she would come back and just be raving about how amazing it was on the free skiing world tour and it was the coolest thing ever and I was like oh yeah like I'm sure it's awesome but whatever the park was great today like (laughs) and uh I got hurt um trying to like uh, progressed too fast in park and was sitting out and she just kept talking about these free ride comps and she's like it would be easier on your body like you were a ski racer you should go to one of these big mountain comps like you would love it and now you're like a park rat she's like I think you would do pretty well like you should check it out and it's like okay like I'm down like signed up for the Crest Butte one and got put on waiting list and had already planned on this huge road trip to all the rest of the remaining comps that year with my roommates. And they uh, were just down to go. They're like, yeah, let's go ski new resorts and check out these free ride comps. Showed up at Crested Butte, it was wait list. 
So we went and hit Urban all day in Crested Butte. <laughs> and it was supposed to be the qualifier day. And we're like, screw it, we'll go hit Urban. And we hit this down flat down off the resort in these condos and uh, hit it all day. And that girl who talked me into going, Amanda, to this comp, text me and she was like did you see they postponed it you should go because someone probably dropped out because it'll be a day later and you might get in off the wait list and so we packed up from the handrail drove back up to the lodge to see if anybody was there and it was julia barlow now and she was at the desk and she was like yeah actually someone dropped out and you're here so you're in for the qualifier tomorrow and it was like it was so sick and it was crazy and you know, like just had such a cool vibe. You're like so nervous and everybody's like, Hey man, like, how you doing? Like, <laughs> are you excited? Like, and you're like, what? No, I'm shitting my pants. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And they're like, Oh, you got it. Like, no worries. Like so stoked for you. And you cross the finish and all these people are cheering and excited. And you have like a hundred new friends, your first day ever in one of these comps. And you're like, yeah, I like this. Oh, wait, we get free Sierra Nevada too? Okay, cool, <laughs> yeah. I can do this. This would be sweet. <laughs> and you just like, and then we were like, okay, let's go to Kirkwood. That's the next one. Let's chase that one. I got in off the wait list again, and it was just like, this is awesome. And everybody was so nice. And from then on, I just kind of never like, except for just skiing park with my buddies, never like as a serious thing took it at all. It was just kind of like, let's go chase Pow and find cliffs to jump off of. Like, let's just do that. Right? <laughs> yeah. All day, every day. <laughs> yeah. Like, this is awesome. Let's do that. And then I went and visited Connery at Squaw, and I was like, holy crap, man. There are more cliffs here than anywhere I've ever seen in my life. And it was that huge year in 2011, and it was just like, yeah, okay, let's go to Squaw. There's a lot of stuff to jump off of. <laughs> Dude, epic. Yeah. It's funny how it just sucks you in. You, it reminds me of the good old days, like Barlow and Julia and freaking Hugo and all them judging or Jim oh, Jack yeah. and Schmitty yeah. and Schmitty, Jim Jack, all those guys. Those Barlow. were the good old days. That was so much fun. Yeah. Kirkwood, that, all that. That was man, like. I think you posted that start list uh, a year ago or so, and not even a year ago. And it was just like, damn, that was like some of the funnest times ever. And because you look at the start list and you're like, holy shit, that was some heavy hitters on that list. And like, it was just cool. It's good vibes, you know? I didn't even necessarily feel like a competition. It was just having fun, pushing each other, the jump off stuff. Right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That was dude, that was definitely epic. I I uh I always wondered what what it was like on the free ride world tour. How was it different when you made it to Europe? How did it differ from like the feel of the free skiing world tour? Cuz I assume that the, it was different, you know, it was a little bit more corporate sponsors and a little bit more money. Um, yeah. But skiing's also has like a lot bigger cultural. Um, it sits more at the heart of you know Europeans than it yeah. does in the U.S. So how yeah how did that differ? I'm curious about that. Uh it was really intense. You know, um, going over that first year, kind of like I'd never been to Europe in my life. Yep. Uh, it was crazy. Like the only venues I had skied were like venues that you could stand on your takeoff and you're like, yeah, this is perfect. Like, okay. Like nice landing cut underneath. Okay. The landing's perfect. Good to go. Like, yeah, it's hard and skied out, but you're like, I know it's here. And then it was boom, like flew into Geneva with Patty Baskins, <laughs> drove up to Chamonix to meet Matt Francisti and it was just like the wolf pack. Yeah. Well, and then it was just like you're like first day looking up at these mountains, and then Larry Laurent Gutier, yeah, like another good old free skiing world tour super free ride series buddy. Uh, we linked all linked up the first day and went skiing, and it was just like it was crazy. Like went to Grand Monte and Chamonix and 
skiing off the side of the glacier and like on the edge of the glacier and it was a blizzard like whiteout and they're talking about there's crevasses and I was like what like never skied near any of this what are you talking <laughs> about like <laughs> we're going out the gates of resorts this is so over my head right now <laughs> and uh patty and i were just like should we be here like <laughs> should we even be here right now like should we just go home this is crazy and like we were already so like in a crazy emotional spot like we had just lost tony cybert and it was we lost him the week before we flew over so it was just kind of like it was just scary heavy emotional let alone you get there and there's so much more media like there's a helicopter flying you around you. Um, <laughs> there's Europeans making real money. Like people are serious about this. Like it's not just free beer and skiing with my friends anymore. This is crazy now. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> and uh, it was great. Uh, we had really good, uh, some really good American veterans on tour that took us all in. Um, Laurent, uh, John Rodowski, uh, Sammy Lubke, uh, Oakley White Allen, um, guys Drew. like that. Yep, Drew. Drew. Yep, uh, Jamie Rizzuto, Drew Tabke. Like, uh, just were like there to like keep your mind in check and let you know, like it's all good. Like it's all good. Like still got your friends. Like we all came from the same stock. Like we know, like it's all good. And uh, so that was cool. Uh, that was good. And like. You know, when you're new on tour, you're brand new, um, and it was only the second year of the merger, like, there was a lot of people, and there was a lot of Euros, and like, uh, um, you know, Barlow never, uh, he always had us, like, we are his kids, you know, like, every American, everything, because he knew we were kind of lost over there, watched out for everybody to make sure we are all taken care of, uh, uh, Frank and... Um, all those guys, like, it was just, like, the, it was just the crew of American guys on the tour that kind of helped guide you and lead you around and made you feel more comfortable. And, you know, and then towards the end of the tour, you're like, all right, like, kind of starting to feel comfortable with this. You're meeting more of the Euros at that point. Like, first year was, tour was different uh, as an American coming on it's so much more chill and mellow now as an American coming on than it was back then. Um, it's crazy. <laughs> <laughs> like everybody's way more friends now. Then it was pretty cutthroat and like, Oh, you might be competition to me. Like, no, not helping you. Nothing <laughs> like, and now it's just like, what can we do to help? Like, yeah. Like anybody who is anybody who is a friend or from North America, like you're trying to watch out for each other. And, uh, and the Europeans are so much nicer now too. Like all the Euros on the tour are just so mellow and so chill. And, uh, you know, like the organization on the tour now is, uh, awesome. Like, uh, we had some really great people that would always be there for you on tour. Uh, and I just felt like my first year on tour was kind of like, uh, North Americans versus Europeans. Yeah. And, uh, it's not so much like that anymore. Um, at all really which is nice it's just kind of everybody's friends with everybody um and you know you everybody knows you're out there risking uh injury to try to have a great run and have fun you know yeah so it's good it's good people you know, yeah it's uh it's intimidating though coming off uh our tour that was for sure like uh and pat and i were kind of like we want to go back this is scary <laughs> and uh <laughs> then you get used to it and everything and then you're like no this is cool like you just get more immune to it and you're like yeah this is awesome hell yeah yeah <laughs> freaking helicopter above us this is crazy <laughs> right you're like sir yeah. i love it <laughs> yeah yeah it's cool like when you finish your run you always gotta look up and just realize you're like ah, i might have screwed up but damn dude there's a helicopter following me into the finish right now this is pretty rad <laughs> right like <laughs> yeah that's awesome that yeah. thing's following me <laughs> yeah you're like dude life's not bad you know who cares if you screwed up this is still pretty rad <laughs> yeah yeah so totally. it's good 
so it's good but uh you know you miss a lot though you miss your friends like uh everybody who you went from skiing with every day of the season and spending most of your winter with go to not seeing them anymore you know it's all of a sudden like oh shit i haven't gotten to ski with so and so in two years and they were my best friend who i skied with every day yeah so that was a kind of a definitely change Wow. Definitely. Did you notice that skiing around different people, did it change your style? Yeah, I noticed like skiing around different people, I would adapt other like other people's style. If I like followed someone around for a day, I might end up doing things a little bit like just like my style would alter just a little bit. Yeah, no, for sure. And I feel like uh, every year I've become a little less uh, jibby or uh, with losing what I hate to say is losing my tricks and park background. Yep. So like, and I don't know if that's necessarily <clears throat> cause uh, I almost just feel like, cause uh, you're traveling so much, you know, you're not like necessarily out every day, just focusing on working on new tricks and stuff like that. But then at the same time, you're gaining comfort and exposure and skiing bigger lines and where you're kind of like before you were just so shit. And now you're like, Oh yeah, this is cool. This is good. It's mellow. Um, but yeah, I feel like, uh, definitely your skiing changes or can also be better by skiing with different people all the time, you know? Yep. Uh, and it helps like, I think the mental side too, cause you know, sometimes you never skied in front of somebody before and you're kind of like, Oh man, like this person's rad. Like I don't want to just fall down this mountain and look <laughs> like a fool. Like <laughs> I want to stomp this. And, like, it helps gain your confidence because you're like, oh, sick, dude. I'm skiing with this crazy skier, like, and, like, I can keep up with them. This is awesome, like, and it can build your confidence, you know? Yeah. So I feel like every time, every year I was on the tour, I still idolized all the skiers around me and snowboarders around me because, you know, you're like, damn, that person is badass, like, and you're, like, stoked on their accomplishments and you get to go ski with them and compete against them or, like, ride with them. And it's yeah. good, I think. Yeah, totally. I mean, like in business, they say, or, you know, they say that you're a combination of the five people you spend the most time around. And I think like when you, uh, yeah, when you get to spend time with people who are at the top of their game, whether in business or in sports or, you know, anything, you just kind of automatically start to embody like, and, you know, do kind of some of the things that they do just because that's kind of what humans do. They kind of, you know, they just, end up mimicking whether you know it or not you just kind of end up mimicking what other people do around you you know oh yeah for sure dude like it's true that's uh definitely happened with the wolf pack <laughs> 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 yeah all of a sudden you're just this goon squad traveling around europe all the time together and you're just like we're just feeding off each other's energy all the time and it's kind of like yeah it's cool like it's yeah. good and it's whether like you know when one person's bumming say like one person's all bunged up and you're just like and then everybody's down and you're like dang like we're all going out today and they're chilling in the hotel because they're hurt and like this sucks like and then like the days where everybody's on a high everybody's on a high and it's like the ultimate high ever and you're just like boom like let's go do this let's go do that and like someone's trying this and that and just feeding off each other's energy to push each other. And it's yep. good. It's really cool. Oh yeah. And, you know, and it all goes stems back to those old comp days, you know, where like comps that weren't going good. And a lot of people fell, people were falling. Comps yep. when people were stomping, people are stomping and every run you're just like, wow, that was crazy. <laughs> yep. Yeah, Totally. Um, what's one of the things that you did to like overcome the fear in that first year? Like you had, you had good people that helped you, but what, like, what were some of the things that you like either told yourself or, or did to, you know, to keep you there when you're like with Patty sitting there like, ah, oh, should we even be here? <laughs> you know, what's, uh, uh what'd you do to keep yourself there? It was kind of uh, just thinking about how lucky I was to have the chance to be there. Yeah. Um, you know, like uh, one thing I always tried to kind of do in the Stargate, no matter uh, 
how freaked out or nervous or whatever was going on mentally would just be to look around and uh, look out of that starting gate and like look around and just be like, this, you're lucky, man. Like not many people get to do this and just think about how lucky you were to be there. And then just remind yourself, you've been skiing your whole life. Like you can do this. Like you're fine. You've been skiing your entire life. You got this. And it would just really help. And you know, like, whether it's go for like a trick or a cliff or something that scares you right away. So then when you land that, you're like, okay, all right, we can do this. Like, let's go. We got this. Yep. <laughs> and, uh, but no, I just always felt like, uh, just, it's always a, such a cool view. Like, you know, like when you're in that start gate, it's a feeling and a view, like, you know, it's, it gets everybody. It gets, I think even the biggest, most successful pros in the world when they would get in the start gate or still if they do they're going to be nervous and excited and the adrenaline's going and so how can you not feel lucky getting to do that and go do what you love and ski down the mountain yeah. so just realizing you're like no you made it here man like you should be here you qualified so enjoy it do this <laughs> yeah yeah totally yeah i uh i have no clue what that feels like that'd be an amazing feeling just to stand in that start gate for sure. Yeah, but it, you know what it's like to stand in the start gate. It's so true. You know, yeah, yeah. Like, it's unreal. Yep. And then it's even more unreal when you cross the finish line. For real, definitely. Yeah. <laughs> That's dude living for the finish line. There are a couple of comments there where you're like, I don't even know why I'm here. I hate this. Yeah. I hate all of this. I'm so <laughs> nervous. Like. Yep. Screw all of this. I'm living for the finish line and the Sierra Nevada's at the end. Like yeah. <laughs> the, no. the only reason why I'm here, I don't care if I ski past every cliff. It all scares me. <laughs> yeah. and then you go out and you do it and you stomp or you fall or whatever, but yeah. you make it to the bottom and life is the most amazing thing in the world and you're grateful yeah. and it's like, oh yeah, okay. Yeah. <laughs> and you're like all excited, talking to your friends, like how'd you do like because that rollover a lot of times you don't ever know how they did like you hear you're like yeah. oh something sick just happened and you know kind of where they're going to ski because of your friends they're going to tell you and so you're like it's just cool yeah but that adrenaline that that like insane like oh shit moment in the start gate and just before you go into the start gate i think it's even worse and then once you're in there you go into the zone a little bit and then when you cross the finish, it's like that peaks and valleys, dude. It's just like crazy. It makes it all worth it. <laughs> totally, dude. Totally. I want to go back to the year that you qualified for the Free Ride World Tour. It seemed like there was maybe something that changed a little bit. Um, like you, you had a mindset shift. Like it seemed like there was a mindset shift in – uh, you found like a consistency and kind of like a it was like a little bit of an underlying confidence is what it looked like from the outside or something. Was there something that changed that year where you you know when where you just like had a conscious mindset shift or or was it just kind of the stars aligned or? Um, I think a lot of it led. Uh, it did feel like. Uh, there was a change of where um, it wasn't like, uh, you know, sometimes we just feel like you're going to stomp stuff. It was kind of one of those times where uh, I just felt like I just had skied so hard with my friends in Tahoe all leading up to that season. Like we were just pushing each other to always try to spin off a downhill takeoff both ways and like then do this and that. And like if you're like starting to land this stuff when you're free skiing all the time with your friends, and then you're looking at the stuff in comps and you're like, well, this is a lot like that or that. It was kind of like, well, why shouldn't I try this? Because I do this every day when I'm skiing with my friends. And I had never felt that confidence before to be able to go like, yeah, if I do this every day with my friends, why not try it in a comp run? And I wasn't worrying about falling anymore. It was more like trying to ski like myself and try to spin both ways. And try to do something that I would do with my friends like that I think would be funny and cool and not even that gnarly, just something funny and cool and just integrate that all into a comp run. And um, that year it really shifted with my mindset of being like ski like my, I do when I'm with my friends and how I watch my friends ski and 
do that. And when I fell in Taos, which was the first comp of the year, such a stacked crew, it was only like four competitions and it was off your three results or something like that. And it was kind of like, oh shit, I fell in Taos. Like I got a 15th. There's no way I'll ever qualify for the tour now. Screw it. Like whatever, no stress anymore. And then Moonlight Basin happened and it was a bad first run, barely made the cut. And I was like, oh, hell, I'm going to ski away from where everybody else does and just do my own kind of line. And it worked and had a three in there. And uh, it was kind of like, oh, that was fun. Like, that was sweet. I was I was really happy. That was fun. And uh, then it was like, whoa, I moved way up on the leaderboard. And I got the sick bird. Like, what the hell? No way. This is crazy. And then I think that kind of helped build my confidence for Crested Butte. And uh, Crested Butte went great. And uh and I never thought I'd ever win a comp before in my life. And then one CB and it was just like, what the hell's going on? This is crazy. And then uh, Snowbird got second and it was just like, it felt like all the cards fell into place and just feeding off the energy of all your friends around you and just having so much fun. And like I had the coolest support of friends that season that like all my friends from Tahoe came out to like watch Davis Connery and myself and Jed Kravitz and everybody compete. They're like, screw it. We're going to come all out too. And we're going to just travel around with you guys. And so we had like a crew of 10 of us. And so it was just like back at Squaw and Alpine skiing with your friends every day, but a competition. So it was easy to just be like, no, I'm here with my friends, just skiing with my friends. Like why not try something like I would with my friends? And I think, uh, you know, it was just the positivity around me and everything just always stayed so positive in my mind. It just kept the confidence high and just like stoked to just try different shit and not worry about if I fell. It was good. Yeah, definitely, man. Yeah, it was cool. I remember specifically at Snowbird, like watching, I, I could just feel like I think the ski behind you, like we skied together at each comp that season pretty much. Yep. And yeah. there were like times we were always around each other. We'd catch a run or whatever. And like you crushed it, Crested Butte. I think you and I were the only ones that threw threes bo- or threw spins both directions day one. Yep. And yep. at Snowbird, I remember like skiing behind you. It might have been in between days. I don't, I don't exactly remember, but skiing behind you and it was like below the, below Baldy venue. There's like that cutoff where you cut off the catwalk on the right. And you can yeah. just send it into oblivion. Yeah. Yep. Yep. And you're just doing these massive like tweaked safeties. And they're just the steediest thing ever. And like I, you just had this confidence skiing behind you that was like, I would take like just like a little hair of a speed check and you like nothing. Just boom. Just <laughs> airing it out. Like that kid is... He's just got something going for him right now. And uh, it was just awesome. It was, oh, thanks, it was cool man. to see, for sure. Thanks, dude. That means a lot. That was, uh, that means a lot. That was, it was just fun, dude, you know, where you're just out having fun all the time. And that's when I feel like you see anybody ski their best is when they're having the most fun in their life, too. It all totally. relates. Like, it's crazy how much it goes hand in hand. and. No matter what it can be, you did the day before. Like, if you're feeling, like, so good and, like, so happy and then you go out on your skis, I feel like you're probably going to ski and be really happy and you're going to be looking like you're skiing really happy and confident and having fun, you know? And it's just a cool thing how it just translates over from one to the other. Totally. It is crazy how you can almost watch someone ski and be like, oh, that, that they're angry. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. They're like, stoked. Yeah. And like, you know, like person doing all these like little like jibbies all down the mountain and then like, ooh, and like slashes and then boost and stuff. You're like, damn, they're having more fun than everybody out here right now. <laughs> right. Well, I guess I can't say it's true because I don't know what everybody else is doing, but they look like they're having more fun than most people. <laughs> Totally. Yeah, definitely, man. It's crazy how skiing totally like you, it, the way you ski reflects your mood 110%. Yeah. Yeah. And like you're having a bad day, you'll ski like crap sometimes and you just be like, dude, I can't do anything right around my skis right now. And it's like, oh, maybe because you're having a bad day. But sometimes those bad days turn great days because you're out in the hill. Totally. Yeah. 
Yeah, man. What's, I guess let's shift gears a little bit. I'm going to do like a couple of rapid fire questions if that works for you. Cool. Yeah. Or I guess it's not, not necessarily rapid fire yet. I have questions here. Um, <laughs> <laughs> That's, I was looking for this document because that normally I'm at home. And okay. on my other computer so that's why yeah. i was on my phone earlier i was trying to find this document because i've been yeah. going just off the cusp <laughs> no no worries so you've been able to travel a lot and you like i think you probably maybe have a little bit more of a macro view on climate change or uh you know anything in that aspect what's your feeling on that and uh, have you noticed anything in skiing? And like, yeah, just what's your what's your opinion on all that? Uh, yeah, you know, um, climate change is real. I don't think anybody listening to this is going to argue that, uh, or that loves to ski. <laughs> but um, you know, like yeah, like uh, traveling a lot. Um, you know, you do leave, leave a footprint. Uh, so I think just being extremely conscious of what you're doing and uh, how you're living and knowing everything you do does in fact affect the uh, environment is just a basis that everybody should be on. Um, And I know like there's the biggest pro athletes in the world who are some of the biggest climate push, like climate change advocates and doing everything they can to help with it, you know, are also leaving the biggest footprint out of most people by their travel schedules and everything. And it's good to see them conscious of that. And, you know, I always think it's funny because like Euros always talk about how little we care about the environment and everything, but you go over to Europe and every European likes to throw their cigarette butts on the ground. And it's just those little steps where you're like, dude, that's littering. Like, come on, man. Like, And it's just little things like that where you're like, it shouldn't be just such a stereotype thrown at only us. Like we need to work on what we're doing, but I get that other governments around the world are taking bigger steps than our government, but individuals necessarily aren't always doing that. Um, and so just kind of learned and observed that. Uh, but when I've only been on the world tour for five years. And the first time I ever went on Argentair Glacier compared to this last season when I was there. And it's completely obvious how much the glacier has receded. It's absolutely terrifying. Like you're like, this is only in five years. What the hell is going on? This is crazy. Like, and I think it's this climate change is just creating uh, extremes in our environment whether it's droughts to people having the biggest winter they've ever had ever. Like we're messing with the environment and it's showing us that. And uh, it's just good to see that a lot of good people and people everywhere around the world, whether it's here at home or in all these other countries are, I hope taking small steps to try to do everything they can. And yeah, like I live in Telluride now. Telluride just had the worst winter since the seventies. And then there's calling it maybe the worst winter in recorded history. And that's sucks, man. My girlfriend and I just bought a house here. Like, and now they're having one of the worst winters they've ever had, you know, and we're in Southwest Colorado, you know, right. places more Southern are gradually getting less snow no matter what. And it's a scary thought. Dude, it is. It's super scary. It's not, it's not comfortable no, no. at all. It's crazy. Um, it's pretty cool. Um, just pulling up a map we have people from all over the world that listen to this podcast so you get russia nice china india australia europeans i love you so don't take any offense to that because your governments are taking bigger steps than our governments but uh definitely there are a lot of cigarette butts on the ground in europe (laughs) right totally man (laughs) definitely and i think it's all about you know like just uh trying to do our best and and trying to you know be aware of the the fact that there's always something that we can improve on no matter what and there's always more to be learned more to be understood about the whole situation yeah. you know i think um that we can continually get more curious 
about the the whole entire situation and not uh, one of the one of our biggest I think faults in it so far has been polarizing with it you know like we just need to get curious instead of like shoving it in everyone's face yeah. being like hey well what if we did this would we be better off like it could we you know could we do this and I think you know a lot of people are very like I, I don't think that you're like super in your face about it in in a lot of ways but it's like um yeah i think you know being able to get curious and be like yeah even just invite the opposition's point of view long enough for them to drop it hopefully yeah no yeah (laughs) but i just uh i don't know i've just kind of lived by the simple rules you know like to mother earth this mother earth like come on like you don't want to mess with it like you don't want like people messing with you don't mess with it you know like exactly do like someone walks in your yard and litters you're gonna be mad so don't walk down the street and litter in somebody else's yard you know like come on (laughs) totally dude yep and that i think you know if we can start just enforcing more of like a community vibe that's one of the things that i talk i've talked about a lot in this podcast is the the community vibe that skiing brings and i think you know the more that we can just encourage um, like humanity and community to connect and have like more, more of a community setting, more of a support network kind of like for everyone, then you will start to see, we'll start to be able to see these changes come like more easily. Even if like, you know, some people may not want to move in, in the direction of change, like eliminating oil or, or stuff like that. But the more that we can like try to understand one another's point of view, then it'll be easier to change together yep. possibly. Yeah. Hopefully. And like we have some amazing ways to create energy. Now we don't have to just rely off what we did in history. Yeah. So, you know, it's, uh, it's a lot of stuff, uh, going on that it's disturbing but then there's also just as many people trying to do good that's inspiring yeah which is good. yeah definitely. i think there's more people trying to do good that's inspiring than there are people trying to do stuff that's disturbing and bad and you're ashamed or super disappointed and i think on a daily basis there's way more people out there doing good than bad. totally which is good yeah because you know it's good to be positive about life right now and try not to focus on the negative Definitely. I think uh, positivity is, is super important. And it's one of the things that keeps me going every day is being internally, uh, eternally optimistic. Mm-hmm. I always try to look for, for the good. You know, uh, you talked about, you know, in the start gate, kind of looking around and thinking about what you're grateful for. I think, you know, anytime that you're overwhelmed or, you know, like just being you know being able to look around and be grateful and then yeah turn around and show that with uh trying to take care of everyone around you or yeah oh totally yeah it's true and uh so what's one piece of encouragement or wisdom that you received throughout like the skiing years that stuck with you or that's you know one of the things that whether in ski racing or uh, something that like a friend or encouragement or wisdom I've seen through, you know, probably just, uh, just honestly, like the people who are the closest around you, you know, like, uh, and their support has always kind of been the best, uh, whether it's family, friends, um, you know, like, whatever it is that's your closest person in your life, you know, or your group that's in your life. It's kind of always been that, you know, like they're the ones who know how to read you, read uh, your emotions. Uh, Like I like to wear my emotions on my sleeve so I can maybe be read a little easier than other people, (laughs) but uh, you know, like listening to them and uh, just being appreciative of them and just, you know, like letting them always lead you in the right direction and be stoked and surround yourself by good people. And uh, I don't know, like uh, just always been really lucky, whether it's been coaches, my parents, uh, my family, uh, 
like throughout my life, I feel like I've been really lucky with a really good support system. And that's kind of helped me get to where I'm at and be able to have done the things I've done. And I feel like uh, the encouragement would kind of come from like them being stoked for you. Like, and, you know, meeting the cool people along the way and like Jim Jack and people like that who are like, no, like you got to do this. This is sweet. Like you can do this. And you're like, hell yeah. Like I look up to you, like no way, you know? And like Hugo, like Dion Newport, all those type of people that are influential in your life. And, uh, you know, Sammy, George, Tabkey, all those guys, like they're what gets you motivated and stoked, dude. And like, you know, like idolizing yeah. Tabkey. And then all of a sudden it's like, holy shit, I'm traveling the world with Tabkey and skiing with him every day. This is crazy. And it's like, how can you not be stoked or encouraged to go get to compete with such rad people or get the, you know, have such rad friends to surround yourself with? Like, um, just always felt really lucky with the people I've met along the way. And it's always been the proper encouragement for it too. Yeah. Like, uh, I don't think there was ever just a single moment where someone said something to me and it was a light switch went off. It was just kind of like people I was lucky enough to be surrounded by the whole time that always kept it going and the motivation and it's always the stoke alive, no matter how cheesy that sounds. No, totally, dude. Definitely. That's awesome. I love that. Um, that might overlap with the next question. Like, What's one piece of advice that you'd pass along to someone that wants to do it? what you've done or you know that just wants to go out and enjoy the sport to the maximum yeah you know um i think i fell in every competition for the first two years i ever competed so you know like sometimes you'll land them and so (laughs) don't focus on following on them all because sometimes you'll land them (laughs) um and uh surround yourself by positive people people who make you happy like we talked about earlier, it's going to reflect in your skiing and it's going to make you happier out in the mountains. Um, whether it's ripping groomers with your friends, do it with the ones who are always positive and stoked and excited to be out there. Don't be bringing yourself down by people who don't want to be having as much fun as you and don't want to be out there with you because there's other people who want to go out and charge with you. Dude, I love that. Absolutely love that. Like, you know, when you're in the bad mood, then that's why you have those good friends and those good people around you because they're the ones who are going to bring you out of it. Just like you'll do for them. Totally. Definitely, man. Love that. If you could have one significant impact in the world, what would it be? Hmm, One significant impact in the world. Huge or just like, you know, what, uh, you know, I guess people can accomplish anything, so. If I could accomplish one thing, just be, I guess have people treat you how you'd want to treat them or how you treat people, have people treat each other how you'd want them to treat you, you know? Like, yeah. just give out that energy and positivity that you thrive off of from other people and like have every person do that. Be nice. I think it'd be a better world. Totally. Just, you know, like... Instead of getting mad in your car and throwing up the finger at somebody, you're like, man, that person did that to me. I'd be super bummed and that would suck. So maybe I shouldn't do it. (laughs) Totally, man. It's a small thing, but I think it would do a lot. Dude, it's it's all the 1% changes that make all the difference, you know? And maybe the people who have never gotten to experience skiing before, let them experience that once in their life and give them that shot. (laughs) Hell yeah. Dude, love it. Because I hate how, I don't like to say that word hate, but I don't like how skiing is becoming an elitist sport. Uh, I want it to be more accessible for more people out there because it sucks that it's turning into only a wealthy person thing. Right? I hate it. I absolutely hate it. I think that we have something that we need to connect on after this interview because there's potentials for a ski movie based out of the Midwest. Lots of things that we've talked about in this this episode so far. So Yeah, I like since the podcast is rolling, we'll chat after. <laughs> yeah, cool. <laughs> Sounds good. And we're almost done. Um two more questions. What's your like do you have a favorite travel tip or hack that you use? 
that like you've been so many places yeah always pack less than you think you need to bring because <laughs> if you're going on a ski trip you're most likely going to be in your long underwear 90 percent of the time so don't bring it that many ski clothes because you're going to end up just wishing you had more ski socks or bring ski clothes don't bring lifestyle clothes wish you had more ski socks and long underwear instead of the rest because that's what you'll be in most of the time and then travel hacks is always download the app for the airline. So then you can check the seating chart before you get on a long flight. And if all of a sudden someone books a seat next to you, you can look for an open seat with two open next to it and you can change last second. And then you might have a whole row to yourself for like a eight hour flight. Boom. <laughs> and that one works really well. That one's awesome. I love that one. <laughs> I fly mostly United and I always have the app and I check an hour before the flight. I'm like, Oh, someone just changed their seat next to me. Time to move. <laughs> <laughs> Not that I don't like meeting new people. I just like space on a long flight. <laughs> yeah, dude, I got you for sure. Then where's the best place for people to find you, follow? Well, I guess two questions. One, what are you up to next? Like what's what's uh, in the in the books for this year? Um, you know, going to hopefully make a ski trip happen in the summer. Um, working just like crazy. Uh you know, got to pay the bills uh, outside of skiing and just uh, hopefully the plan for next year is to work on a web series with uh, some close friends and uh, visit friends I've met along the way and get to ski at their home ski areas, whether it's in Austria um, or back here in the States and try to document it and put out a good web series with uh, some close friends and uh enjoy life you know like stoked on uh skiing right now like always but a little bit more than i have been in the last few years and excited for what's next sick where can everyone find you or follow that journey uh well my instagram is at peltski p-e-l-t-s-k-i and then i have a facebook page connor pelton um and I'm working on the logistics of the web series, but I'll be dropping a uh, season edit from uh, being lucky enough to ski from Japan all the way uh, back to the U.S. and almost around the world. So I'll be dropping a uh, season edit from that um, in the next month or so. Sick, man. Well, we will definitely look out for that, and I'll post that on the Instagram and then – we're going to have a new website up here very shortly. Nice. So I'll feature that on the website as well. Awesome. Oh, well, sweet, well, buddy. Thank it. you so much for being on. Yeah, no, thank you. It's great catching up. It's been too long. And uh, anybody who wanted to listen in, thanks for tuning in. Well, there you have it, folks. Episode number 23 with Connor Pelton. I hope you really enjoyed this episode. As always, we really appreciate it if you rate, review, and subscribe. We've got some really fun things happening uh, in the world of the athletic stance. If you want to learn more, go ahead and check out our YouTube channel where I'm teaching athletes how to become influencers and entrepreneurs. And I'd really love your support there. So if you've made it this far and you want to learn more about the new and exciting world of the athletic stance, definitely check that out at, at YouTube and search The Athletic Stance. Thank you guys so much. As always, thank you for tuning in, and we'll see you next week.